When I was seven years old, my parents took my younger brother and I to go see Star Wars. My seven-year-old mind was not prepared for what I was about to see. <laughs> Apart from the special effects and the epic struggle between good and evil, it opened my mind. I had so many questions. Was the force real? Could I build my own lightsaber? And how cool would it be to have a badass droid sidekick like R2-D2 to fix my bike? <laughs> well, 40 years later, I was just settling into my new role as distinguished designer, and I had been asked to develop the AI design principles for my company. And as luck would have it, there in the lunchroom at my studio was a brand new Pepper robot. I had read about how Peppers were being paired with AI, and I was like a kid on Christmas morning. I could not wait to tear into this present. I knew that Peppers could talk and listen, but honestly, I didn't know what to say. And more importantly, I didn't know how I was supposed to interact with it. Was I supposed to walk up and say hi? Was I supposed to try to shake its hand? I found myself getting a little anxious, so I decided to just settle into it easily by geeking out on its industrial design. So I sit down, and I'm checking out its treads, and I'm checking out its articulated joints, and I get up to its head, and I'm looking at its eye, and it just snaps its head towards me, unfurls its fingers, and waves hello. And I said, nope. <laughs> and walked back to my desk as fast as I could. <laughs> so I'm sitting at my desk, and I start beating myself up. What's the matter with you? You've been waiting for this moment since you were seven years old. Why are you freaking out? Something wasn't right, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Pepper acted appropriately. I mean, it tried to wave hello, but it just left me feeling creeped out. <laughs> the more I thought about it, I realized that it was Pepper's ability to act on its own that gave me the willies. I didn't initiate contact. It did. On paper, I should have expected this. Droids didn't wait to be spoken to. Why should Pepper be any different? You see, the difference is, is I didn't invoke it with a Hey Siri or an OK Google. It made the first move, and I wasn't ready for that. Mentally, I was ready to dive right in. Emotionally, I folded like Superman on laundry day. <laughs> I wanted to form a connection with that robot, but what I got back in return was emotive mimicry. And I'm not trying to pin this on Pepper's engineers. They were probably just trying to get the technology to work as expected. What's really important to me, though, is that they probably didn't have a map to help guide them to form and design for emotionally authentic relationships between humans and machines. Going into this work, my expectations weren't set by Pepper. They were set by my imagination. And this is a hell of a hurdle for AI to climb, because AI is already in our heads. It comes from the movies and the TV shows that we watch. And it comes in two basic flavors. The first is the PhD in a box, where you come with just about any question that you might have, and it magically has the answer. The second is doom and dystopia, titanium skeletons with glowing red eyes <laughs> hunting us down without mercy. <laughs> For right now, we don't have much to worry about. The average age, I mean, the average IQ of a six-year-old is 56. The smartest AI today has an IQ of 47. In essence, they're digital kindergartners which means that we are on the hook to teach them how to form a relationship with us. So my team and I were sitting around, and we were talking about, well, how will we form this relationship? How do we go about teaching the machine how to form the relationship? And we came up with a, a simple idea. We thought it would be a good idea 
to try and form the basis of an inside joke between a human and a machine. An inside joke signals compatibility, and it's the fastest way to unequivocally know that you are on the same page as the person that you share the joke with. As it turns out, it's not so simple. It's a fairly intricate dance. To form an inside joke between two people requires us to calibrate our personalities, to form personal dialects, so that we can get that shared meaning that makes the joke work. For right now, we're trying to just do the personality calibration with the machine, and we're doing this by interpreting human intent through natural language understanding and pairing that with tone and semantic analysis in real time so that we can find the opening for that inside joke to occur right there between the human and the machine, no matter who sits down in front of it. There's nothing easy about this, but if we can pull this off, there are some amazing possibilities that are waiting for us on the other side. Imagine an AI that can know and predict what you want or need based on a sliver of information, like the tone of your voice or a particular phrase that you're fond of. It would be like when you were growing up and you'd ask your mom to make you a grilled cheese just the way you like it. And she knew exactly what that meant. And think about all the subtext wrapped into those two little exchanges, just the way I like it. And she knew exactly what you meant. There's compassion, there's warmth, there's desire, there's understanding in this little sliver of conversation. For the past 72 years, we have been communicating with computers on their terms. All of the user interfaces that we're surrounded by are nothing more than elaborate workarounds for us to share our intent with a computer. Today, we are right on the cusp of an evolution in our relationships with humans and machines. You see, these machines aren't programmed, they're taught. And this means that a machine can understand, reason, learn, and interact. And these are the very building blocks of what a machine needs to form and maintain a relationship with a human. While these machines are just gaining this skill, we humans will try to form a relationship with just about anything. Quick show of hands, who here has ever named their car or described their laptop as being cranky or uncooperative? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So this is because we have something called intelligent social cognition. In other words, our minds are conditioned to perceive and see other minds. What am I really trying to say here? What I'm trying to say is that we are going to form these relationships with AI, whether there is design intention or not. It is inevitable. And if it is inevitable, then we have to ask ourselves, what type of relationship do we want to have with these machines? Do we want it to be fear, intimidation, that doom and dystopia? I prefer to go back to my seven-year-old self sitting in that movie theater looking up at that screen and what those droids represented to me. And what I saw there was trust, bravery, concern, joy, love. You see, designing for AI isn't about designing for the technology. It's about designing for ourselves. And in order to do this, we have to consciously understand ourselves in ways that we are just starting to wrap our heads around. But if we can do this, we can help them help us be the best version of ourselves. Thank you.